So I'm joined here by Professor William Webb. He's past president of the IET and somewhat of a guru when it comes to wireless communication. So William, first question I'm going to ask you really is a lot of things in the news about 5G at the moment. Um, first of all, what was 3G and what was 4G? And what is the G, if you wouldn't mind uh, telling us all about uh, yeah. that? Well, that's a good question. So mobile phones tend to go through this process of changing generations about once a decade. Mm -hmm. And each time we typically get faster. So if you can remember right back to, to 2G days, you just about had data then, it might have done 200 kilobits a second. 3G came along, the aim of 3G was to give you really good data. That took up, went up to about two megabits a second, but that still proved not to be quite enough. So 10 years later along came 4G, taking that up to about 20 megabits a second, which is what we have now and gives us pretty good service. And 5G is essentially another step in that process. It takes us up about another tenfold into the hundreds of megabits a second. Um, not that we need that right now, but there are some out there saying that we will need that in the future. And so we're preparing the ground for doing that. And what's the difference between um, sort of old school radio that we used to listen to and how that was broadcast and, and, and this kind of G network that, that has been set up for mobile phones? So not a lot at, at first glance. They all use masts with antennas that send out radio signals that we receive with a receiver, a radio receiver or a cellular handset. Probably the key difference is just in the scale of the number of masts. So for radio transmissions, the whole of the UK might be covered with about a thousand masts. But when we look at cellular systems at the moment, each mobile operator has got about 20,000 masts, so about 20 times more. What that means is that the, the areas they broadcast over, what we call the cells, are much smaller. And we need to do that with mobile phones because actually the only way to get enough capacity to handle all of our data requirements, all of the videos we want to download and the Facebook pages we want to look at, is to have lots and lots of these cells because each cell has a certain amount of capacity. So the more of those we can add into the network, the more overall capacity we've got. So really that's the only real difference, the fact that there's a lot more cells in a cellular system than there is in a radio or a TV broadcast kind of approach. And we're all very used to 4G now. Generally, everybody with a smartphone would probably be on a 4G network. What's the real technical difference between that and 5G? And obviously, with, with relevance to all of the things we're hearing in the news mm. about, you know, people's opinion on 5G. Sure. So, so actually, interestingly, 5G is, is being marketed to us as a really dramatic change, uh, uh, something that is going to really transform the way we, we live and work. But actually, the change in the radio system is probably the smallest change we've seen yet. So in the past, each different G tended to use a different technical approach to the way that the data was mapped onto the radio signal. It's called the modulation process. 5G actually uses almost exactly the same process as 4G. So hardly any change there. The, the big difference with 5G is it's intending to use much cleverer antennas. So these are the big white blocks that you typically see on top of the cellular towers on the masts and so on. And in 4G, they just transmit their signal over quite a wide area. Um, and if you happen to be in that area, you can pick it up. With 5G, the aim is to focus the signal like a beam of a searchlight onto the, the person or the phone that actually needs that particular data at that moment in time. And that focusing of the signal brings about a number of benefits. It allows it to go further, but also it brings a lot more capacity into the system. So that's really the biggest change in 5G, the idea that we're using much smarter antennas to try and focus the energy rather than just spread it out in a, a very general fashion. And, and is, the, is the actual radio waves and the, and the, the sort of uh, the frequency that, those, that 5G uses is very different to 4G or is it, is it pretty much on the same network? So at the moment, it's pretty similar. Um, and I said at the moment because actually there's two different frequency bands that have been proposed for 5G. One is quite close to 4G, uh, and that's the one that's currently being used when you hear people like Vodafone and, and EE and others say they've got 5G. That's what they're using at the moment. Uh, but there is a concept of using a much, much higher frequency band, sometimes called millimeter waves, because the wavelength of the the electromagnetic waves at that point is very, very short. It's less than a centimetre, so it's in the millimetres. 
and the advantage of these is that they have enormous capacity. So you could have vast numbers of users doing all sorts of high definition video downloads. But at the moment, really very, very few operators, maybe one or two in the US, but hardly any, are actually employing those kind of frequencies because they found that the lower frequencies, the ones that are close to 4G, are more than sufficient for their needs at the moment. And it's really unclear if those higher frequencies are going to come into widespread use. But if they are, I think we're still five years or more away from that really happening at any kind of scale. And th there's there's been some talk in the press of a thing called a MIMO or a massive MIMO, M-I-M-O. Mm. What on earth is that? So that's actually the antenna that I was talking about earlier. Um, it's a terrible acronym and it's very, very confusing. Um, MIMO, M-I-M-O, actually stands for multiple input, multiple output. And it just really means that um, instead of having one antenna inside that white block, you've actually got tens or in some cases even hundreds of antennas, little ones, and then you use them in combination to create these beams. Uh, and, and at the user's end in your handset, also you might have two or four antennas, and again, you use them in combination to create these beams. So, so it's the terminology that's given to, to, to antennas. I prefer to just call them beam-forming antennas because that's a better description of what they do. I know, a, a massive MIMO in itself, it, it kind of gives that feeling of some sort of, you know, huge gargantuan thing, a massive MIMO, but actually it, it, it's just a, an acronym as well, an acronym. It, it is, although these antennas are bigger physically than, than other antennas because they've got to cram in lots of, lots of small antennas essentially into one big panel. So if you saw one at a cell site, it would look about two to three times larger than the existing antennas so so it's bigger it's not you know so big that it's kind of um, billboard size or anything like that um, but it does create some issues at some cell sites just in terms of the practicality of finding space for these kind of things the other thing as well is is that people talk about it being on a 3.6 gigahertz band mm. which sits somewhere between wi-fi at two and a half five uh, what, what are all the bands what does that actually mean to someone like me yeah, so um, if you think about light, and light is always a good thing to think about because actually light is, is also part of the electromagnetic spectrum as our radio waves. So radio waves are essentially just a form of light at a lower frequency. We're kind of used to, to different colors of light. We kind of understand that actually we've got ultraviolet, we've got infrared, we've got visible light, and that splits down into yellow and green and blue. And, and some of us know that that's actually to do with the particular frequency of the radio waves or the electromagnetic waves in those bands. And when we're talking about cellular systems, it's just the same, really. We're just taking different parts of the radio band and using them in the same manner. And the key difference really is with the radio bands, the lower you are in frequency, the further the radio waves will go, or the more easily they'll enter into homes and things like that. But the less amount of spectrum you've got at those frequencies, so the less capacity, so if you take very low frequencies, like the ones that are currently used for some of the 4G systems at, let's say, 800 megahertz, which is 0 0.8 of a gigahertz, that goes a long way. But there isn't much space there for, for lots of different uh, video channels or whatever. As you move up in frequency to 1.8 gigahertz, where some of the other 4G stuff is, and then indeed, as you said, 2.5 um, gigahertz, where Wi-Fi is and so on, the signals go less and less far, but you have more bandwidth to do stuff with them. And the 5G band is actually, as you, as you rightly said, at 3.5 gigahertz. So it's higher still than 4G. So the signals don't go as far, um, but you've got even more bandwidth. But it's not so far away from the 4G that it's going to have completely different properties. It's kind of a continuum. Uh, it goes a little less far, has a little more bandwidth but generally behaves in the same kind of manner as 4G. So, so as a child, I was brought up in the Middle East and we used to listen to BBC World Service on long mm. wave, really mm. long frequencies, terrible reception, but we could listen to it from an antenna somewhere hundreds and thousands of miles away type, type thing. Are we, are we basically talking about the same thing there? Is that those that was one big antenna pumping out very long frequency radio, and now this is much shorter, hence you need more um, towers? That's, that's spot on. Um, in fact, uh, those kind of long wave transmissions 
um, are at an extreme, really. I mentioned, you know, as you go to lower and lower frequencies, it goes further and further. Long wave is at a really low frequency, so it goes a very long way, in some cases, thousands of kilometers. But the amount of bandwidth you've got there, the, the, the amount of room to put data onto it is tiny, tiny. So you have to send hardly any data for each radio channel. And that's a bit like having an MP3 file at a very, very low encoding rate. The quality is awful. Yeah, it, it allowed us to stay in touch what was happening in the UK, but music yeah. wasn't, was, wasn't worth <laughs> listening to. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's other bands being mentioned. There's 700 megahertz. We've heard 26 gigahertz. Mm. That all sounds a lot more than 3.5. Um, is that what people are worrying about? So, yeah, if we turn now to, to the worries, and the worries are our health concerns, I think the first thing to make absolutely clear is there is absolutely no studies or no evidence of any health concerns whatsoever with any of this stuff, full stop. We've been using mobile phones for over 30 years now. Frankly, if there was going to be any health effects, we would have seen them by now. Um, and 5G is not materially different from 4G or 3G, so it's not going to change that, that effect whatsoever. And there's been hundreds, literally, of scientific studies into this, none of which have shown any kind of, of real problem in real life, um, at least none of the ones that are reputable studies. So it, these, all these kind of concerns really are misplaced, um, and there is absolutely nothing behind them. Now, that doesn't stop people being concerned, of course. And, and often they will point to differences in 5G and they will say, well, it's higher frequency or, or similar, and that might cause a difference. And the frequency does have a very minor effect on, on the radiation, but it's not really a hugely material one. So the fact we move around in frequencies doesn't really change anything very much. Uh, and indeed, if you're worried about high frequencies, well, light is very high frequency, stay indoors. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, going back in, in, into the day when mobiles came, first came out and I was lucky to be around in that sort of day, um, there was a big thing about not wearing headphones because that could carry the, the, the radio frequencies through your brain. Don't hold your phone was another one to your ear because the aerial on the top, we used to have big aerials, would go into your brain. So then you were like, well, should I wear a headphones or should I hold it to my ear? And there was a whole bunch of stuff. And then when the next phase came out, there was other sort of scares and people trying to get scaremonger. But like you say, nothing's come about. What drives those concerns? Uh, and, and is it just new? Is it just something that's new that can be blamed? Yeah, I find it hard to understand, actually. Um, as a, an engineer and a scientist, I tend to look for evidence, and there just is no evidence. So I look at it and think, what, why do people have those concerns? And when you do talk to them, they're not, they're not really logical concerns, they're emotional concerns. And I'm not trying to downplay them because of that. Emotional concerns are powerful concerns. Um, but I think they are just things that, that they're just people that are inherently worried by technology, by newness, by differences. And they see something different happening. They maybe see a tower, it looks to them ugly, perhaps threatening in some way, shape or form visually. And that triggers some kind of emotional response. Um, that's all I can think of really, because there's certainly nothing that you could say logically we should now be more concerned about this or we should change our approach to this kind of thing. And you're quite right about the, the old adage of you know, how should you use your phone? And actually, interestingly, if you if you are worried about the amount of energy you're absorbing, and, and, I, and I have to say again, you shouldn't be because it's well, well, well below any kind of realistic limits. But if you are worried, actually, you absorb much, much more from your handset than you do from any base station because it's close to you. So actually don't worry about the base station, just throw your handset away. And if you're doing that, I would turn off and throw your Wi-Fi away and your cordless phone as well, because they're all the same kind of ilk. That's what you need to do if you're worried, not get too concerned about 5G masks, but you shouldn't and, be worried. And is there anything else you would add about 5G from your knowledge of what's out there? I mean, presumably there'll be a 6G. So this is just another one of those 10 yearly things. Are those 10 yearly gaps getting closer? Or have we got 6G already mm. in discussion? <laughs> we have got 6G in discussion, actually. Um, it's a bit like painting the fourth bridge in a way. It's, it does take about 10 years from the time when the researchers in the academic community first start thinking about what a new generation might look like through to those ideas crystallizing, then being turned into standards that the standards bodies can produce 
and then those becoming chipsets and then those making it into base stations and handsets and then making it into the consumer world. So, so in a way, that's why you can't have these kind of generations happening any, any quicker than about 10 years, because that's just the cycle you need to go through to get any material kind of change. And since we've had one, two, three, four, and 5G, it's certainly a reasonable extrapolation to suggest we might get 6G. I, I would, might push back slightly. I'm um, a little less convinced that we do need the, the super fast speeds that 5G has brought about. You know, it feels to me that the previous speed increments were, were useful ones, but eventually you get to a point where you have really got enough speed. It's like getting a car that can do 100 miles an hour and saying, great, now you need one that can do 500. And you might say, well, that's yeah, nice, but what use is it? And I do think that 5G will be more than enough for a long time. And the mobile operators are businesses, so they won't want to invest in a new generation like 6G unless they can really see a need for it. So I think there's some debate over whether we will see 6G, whether it will be 10 years from now or a bit longer. Um, but, you know, who, who can tell? That's certainly the course we're on at the moment. And it seems like video has been the main driver here for trying to get the speed up. I mean, it's only, gosh, 15 years ago where trying to watch a video on anything other than a television was almost impossible. Um, was it 2006 YouTube first yeah. came online? I mean, that's 14 years ago. So, you know, is it now that codecs are going to get better and the compression of video will get better? So if we want to have 4K on a phone, which I don't know why you would, because I, you know your phone's only a certain side, yeah. but let's say everybody does, that probably would be possible on 4G if the codecs were better at compressing the data. Yeah, and, and you're quite right that what we've, what we've tended to see really simplistically over the years is actually the codecs have got better and better, but our desire for higher and higher resolution has gone up. And the two have broadly cancelled each other out. So actually, the amount of bandwidth we need for a video viewing or channel or conversation or whatever has more or less stayed the same. But I think we are getting to the point of very limited returns. Uh, once you've got, as you rightly say, to even high definition on your handset, then most handsets just don't have the number of pixels on their screen to display anything of any greater definition than that. So there's no point going to 4K on your handset. Uh, it's only really if you've got a nice big flat panel screen at home that you can start to notice the benefits of 4G. And that's not really mobile. That tends to come down your home broadband connection rather than your mobile. But video certainly drives everything. So if you look at the total traffic volumes on the network, about 80% is video, and that's likely to increase over time. Hmm. So the amount of video we consume and the definition that we choose to consume it at right now are the key drivers as to how much data that we need from our mobile phone networks. So in short then, William, it sounds like we should be pretty relaxed about 5G. Oh, certainly from a health point of view, uh, there, there is absolutely no reason to suppose, first of all, that it's any materially different from 4G, and secondly, that there's any kind of risk whatsoever um, for that. So, so yes, I think that's, that's right. Um, there's no need to get worried or alarmed. Uh, and 5G isn't that extensive either anyway. It's only deployed in city centres initially so it's unlikely to be close to where you live for most people um, if that is a concern fantastic well william thank you very much and uh, and hopefully we'll uh, all stay safe and uh, and we'll see you out the other side next time we're in the office sounds good <laughs>